Are you, like a lot of homeschooling parents, ready to throw your math curriculum right out the window? (laughs) Today, we're talking with our guest, Jean Heft, about how to succeed at math in your homeschool. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Before we get started, remember to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, click the bell to join our channel. Hi, I'm Lisa Maladnik, and today we're going to tell you how to succeed at math in your homeschool. And our guest today is Jean Heft, a lifelong Catholic with 34 years of experience teaching math and vast experience working with the difficult-to-teach learner. She's got a BA from the University of Michigan in math education and a master's in instruction from Marygrove University. She's a wife and mother of three and teaches everything from fourth grade math to statistics and personal finance at Homeschool Connections. By the way, there are still openings in her advanced math pre-calculus class. I almost said pre-calc, but I want to say the whole word, calculus, starting September 14th. So get right in there. If you want to sneak into that class, you've got a little bit more time. You can find Jean at her website, jeanhefteducationalservices.com. And I'm going to spell out Jean Heft Educational Services is spelled the way it's spelled, but it was also going to be in the show notes. So no worries if you're driving or something listening to this. And it's Jean, J-E-A-N, Heft, H-O-E-F-T, educationalservices.com. Welcome to the program, Jean. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's just my pleasure. Um, I love to say, and I know I'm going to make you laugh, that you are a hero in our household and in other (laughs) friends' households as well. Um, You were one of my daughter's favorite teachers in high school. Before she went off to college, she had had terrible math anxiety, even though she had math ability. She had tested high when she was still in the public schools for, for ability, and yet there was just one bad program after another that that set her up to be very anxious about math, even after we started homeschooling. So it really is a genuine honor for me to talk with you today and to share you with more of the world. Well, thanks. (laughs) Anyway, so why don't we just talk about how kids learn math well and maybe talk about some typical reasons our kids struggle? Sure. Well, one of the things that I have noticed, and this is across the board, this is children from 10 years old or younger. I just, my experience is about 10 um, to high school and college age students is that they, we don't, we don't learn math the way that we learn history or English or other subjects where there's a lot of language involved. We learn math by doing what I consider like calisthenics. We have to practice it. We have to struggle with it. And in our culture, if we struggle with something, we immediately assume we're no good at it, right? We, you know, oh, well, I, I should just know this. I had one of my own children would say that all the time. He would say, well, I should know this. And why would you think you should know this? You know, did, did you, you know, variables, did, did a variable just jump out at you in the street? Of course, you're not going to know what that is, you know? So learning math is very much, um, and I have done a lot of brain research in my studies um, and in my postgraduate work. And uh, we, we find that students have to, have to hear, see, and of course, try things. So, you know, all of those uh, different ways of experiencing math. And of course, any learning is better when you experience it in many ways. But you have to try it. You have to struggle with it. And then the funny thing is, you have to sleep on it. <laughs> so when, no, seriously, when you're asleep, you... Uh, you know, somehow you are making connections. And then the next day, and I found this out long before I ever studied it. 
I would have students in class the, the day after I had presented a topic that would say, oh, well, if you had taught it that way yesterday, I would have gotten it. And I'm sitting there laughing, thinking, I did say it that way yesterday. <laughs> but I, again, so, you know, I was like, okay, well, they just have to, it has to kind of marinate in their head, Ooh, right? That's so interesting. And then I, yeah. And then I went to classes and, you know, they, in brain research and they were telling us this and I went, oh, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, yeah, it's so important. Wow, it's that's important really to interesting. Sleep. It's important to sleep on it. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, struggling and sleeping on it. That is really neat. So what is it that keeps us from learning it well? What are so like some typical reasons that we don't come to the table in the right mindset? Is it because we're not willing to struggle, like you said? Is it just that aversion? Well, that, that definitely is part of it. Um, part of it also is we tend to rush through the foundations of math. We tend to try to make it as easy for children as we can. And when we do that, sometimes we, and I hate to use the term dummy down because, you know, the, nobody is trying to make things, you know, so that it's so simple that it doesn't matter. But in, in a sense, that's what we do. So it's really important that they have those foundations. And then, like you say, when they are having to apply them and analyze what they've done, all those higher level thinking skills, it's important that you let them like stop and look. And it's, it's okay if it takes a half an hour for a child to, or young adult, to look at a problem and to, you know, have difficulty with it. And it's okay if they make the wrong, because I will say oftentimes to students, especially those that I'm working with that have difficulties, I will say, okay, what do you think you do next? And they'll go, well, I think I do this, right? And I'll say, I don't know. Is that right? And it's okay to be wrong. It's okay. Actually, it's better if you're wrong. Because one of the biggest things is if you don't have to work at something, you don't really own it right? If you could go out and just play baseball perfectly, so you could go out and play for a major league team today, well, would you value that as much as if you had to really work and, you know, go to batting practice constantly? Well, math is the same thing. So we really have to let them make mistakes and say, no, that isn't the right answer. Try again. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, so this sounds like a very good life lesson too, Jean, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, my, my kids are like, oh, mom, you say math is in everything. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> hey, we could so, go yeah. there, couldn't we? We could do a math is in everything conversation about music and art and order in the universe and just about everything, right? Yes. Well, I did a summer camp this summer called the Wow Factor, and that's exactly Ooh. what it was. Looking at math in art, looking at math in music, looking at math in computer programming, you know, in graphic arts. So, yes, it was very fun. Wow. Is that something awesome. that's in the archives at Homeschool Connections? Can they find it there or where is that program? Well, it, it was through Homeschool Connections. I'm not quite sure if it is in the recorded courses yet. We've been, uh, as you know, with the COVID-19 <laughs> problems, people, they, the people at Homeschool Connections have just been slammed. So yes. I'm not sure if it's in the archives yet, but it will be soon if it is not. Wow, the wow factor. I'm excited about that one. That sounds really, really fun. And I would think too, Jean, is that a nice course for introducing children to the wonder of math, maybe before they get into higher math to get them a little more engaged? Well, some of the topics that we talk about are pretty high level, but I had some students with special needs in my summer camp. And I'll tell you what, all of the students felt very comfortable because we all learned. We all learned new, interesting things. Uh, we all looked at things differently. 
And I had them create some artwork, which anybody who knows me would laugh because I am the least artistic person probably ever. I mean, <laughs> students in geometry classes would always laugh because I can't draw. I have to draw stick figures. Um, so, you know, I had them draw and create some artwork and it was just beautiful because we wow. all, you know, we all learned something there. So it was neat. Mm, yeah, math even converts people to faith. You could probably probably do a theology of math class at some point because astrophysicists are discovering the incredible improbability of anything mathematically in the universe's order being random and are going from being atheists to deists like boom, like that. They're having epiphanies. So, I mean, I could talk to you yeah. all day about this. I think it's an incredible topic. Um, so... Let's talk about our home environments. Like, is there a particular environment that might support math learning? What do you What do you think? Well, I do. I I think that it's really important that a student has a study area that is not on their bed, that is not at the dining room table, which you know, and that's difficult for homeschooling moms, homeschooling parents. Um, in general, because, of course, we're trying to observe and monitor what they're doing online, right? So you want them in the middle of the house. Um, so maybe for the class, that would be fine if they're taking a live class. But when they're working on their homework, I really suggest a quiet area, no distractions. And that's another big key, um, a lot of students, teenagers will say, oh, I work best when I have music going. Uh, brain research shows that you really don't, you don't internalize as well if you have those other things going on so that somewhere in your brain you're recognizing the, the you know, what is happening auditorily. Um, unless it was classical music and very, very, very quiet. Mm. So... Wow, that's really interesting, because I, I remember in college, so many people blasting music while they were studying. It was almost impossible to be in the dormitories for that reason, and they claimed it helped them focus. Maybe it helped them block out other distractions, but as you're saying, you're not internalizing in the same way because of the way our brains work. Yes, exactly. You're, you're adding chaos to the mix, which, and you know, that now that is... I would say that's a generalization. So you will have, you know, children who are autistic, who need some kind of white noise or something. That, that's a special case. That's not for your general population learner, though. Mm, that's very interesting. And as always, you are, the, you are the teacher of your child and you know your child the best. That's another thing. Parents don't have enough confidence in their homeschooling. And you need to know that, you know, I'm telling you these things as a math person and I welcome emails and I welcome people um, asking questions. I am not God. So I don't know your child as well as you do. So I would say, take what I'm telling you as advice. But if you know differently for your child, then go with that because you are the expert on your child. Mm. Great point, Jean, because we have so many different family cultures, expectations, yeah. noise levels, emotional levels in different homes. I mean, it's really amazing the variety. Um, one of the great things about having our kids visit other people's homes is to get that sense of diversity in terms of the way people operate at their best. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Really. So interesting. Talk a little bit about predictability. I know that you've mentioned that it's important. Yes, and I didn't really put that into here yet, but that's exactly, that is, uh, I think, one of the biggest things. So having a specific place to work is important, but having a specific time that you will work on math from 10 to 11 every day of the week. Now, you don't have to do it on Saturday and Sunday. But you must work on this for an hour or whatever your choice of the time is every day at the same time. That is so important as well, because just like the rituals of the mass are so important to our deeply engrossing ourselves in the mass, 
that is very true for other aspects of our lives as well. If your child knows that from 10 to 11 every morning, they are going to be doing math, they are much quicker to get themselves engrossed in the work. So predictability, knowing that this is going to happen every single day at that time, is very important for learning. And it also gets them much more um, comfortable with the topic. So as you, you know, we were talking about your daughter um, and how she had math anxiety. If your child has any kind of anxiety with math, making it predictably happen at the same time is one small thing that will reduce their anxiety tremendously. Mm. Very interesting. And it makes me think about research on sleep issues, where if we have routines before bed, our brains start to anticipate the sleep time and start to gradually move in that direction. And I'm thinking if our brains need to gear up for something that requires full concentration, having a routine around that, it just makes sense. Um, Is there anything that's coming up for you around the brain research that you've been looking into on that? Um, on the predictability of it, that yes, they will engage quicker and they will, so they get engrossed in the topic faster, which of course leads to understanding much quicker. So understanding topics quicker and then you won't be fighting them every day. So if you're fighting them, I had one uh, family not too long ago that they had their daughter in my algebra one class And come to find out about halfway through the semester, she started really struggling. And I was contacting them. They were contacting me. Well, then eventually it came out that she was doing all of her math Sunday night for the entire week. And I said, okay, well, there right there is, is probably the biggest issue. She's not, her brain doesn't, you know, it's all those things that I've already talked about. Her brain doesn't have enough time to marinate on each topic. Uh, that's part of it. The other part of it is, you know, you can imagine all these homeschool kids out there are laughing right now because they're like, yeah, I leave it all till the last minute. And then, oh, I hate sitting down and, you know, going through. Well, yeah, of course you're going to, you know, so if you, I don't care, you're going to do math from 10 to 11 every day, whatever that is, um, that will take away that, that struggle to get them to do it. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things about how the brain works and how funny that is. How it uh, you're happier, you're more inclined to be co- cooperative, you are more inclined to be engaged with that predictability. Yeah, we're just it- funny. That's how we're made. Yeah, we are funny (laughs) creatures. A couple of other things that are coming up for me as a coach. I work a lot with people on things like time management and work-life balance and things like that. And when you have a specific time scheduled to get something done, your stress levels drop because you know you're going to get it done at that time so you can focus on other things. You get out of your amygdala and into your, what is that, the frontal cortex where you can problem solve and be creative and all of that. And as you said, because there's that time will it set aside it's kind of safely placed in the schedule there's more room for reflection everything that you talked about before about letting the the learning deepen and make connections because you've slept on it and the other thing that occurs to me is that parents listening might build in just a small reward at the end of that math hour every day maybe that's the time that that kid gets to have their favorite coffee or whatever, a mid-morning donut, or I don't know, something healthier than that, probably. But so that they have a sense of accomplishment, or maybe, you know, just high five at the end of the math hour, you know, good for you. Maybe it didn't go perfectly. Maybe today wasn't as good as yesterday, but you put in your hour, good for you, because brain research shows, and you're going to love this, I'm a hobbyist in that area, too. I love uh, all the stuff that's out there that's so good for the layperson to be able to take it all in, that when we do that little dopamine hit, at the end of a, a, after doing something and establishing a new habit, our brain remembers it as a good thing and starts to look forward to the next time. Whereas when we just go, oh, thank God that's over and throw the book down, the brain ag- automatically shifts into the amygdala every time you anticipate that thing. So trying to develop a little bit of positivity about it, a little bit of a reward like good for me, even a little fist pump at the end of the hour, that trains your brain to look forward to that thing and be in a much better place. 
And you're inspiring me for my workout because that's the thing that I dread every single day. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Which is because the, if if you've had a history, as we all have, of trying to form new habits and then having them fall apart, for oftentimes for good reasons, you got sick or life got busy or whatever it was, we, we develop some dread about the thing. And when we start to do it again, in the back of our minds, that tape is playing, oh, I'm just going to fail again. How many days will I do it this time before something comes up? Instead, you do you do the thing, congratulate yourself no matter how well or poorly or how much you did, and your brain starts to go, oh, I want to do that again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, fun stuff. So, so yeah, go ahead. You had asked earlier about uh, particular programs. And, yes. you know, again, you really need to know what kind of learner your child is. I have had a lot of success with Saxon. Um, and I know there's a group of parents out there gonna that are going, oh, right now. Because <laughs> Saxon is, I don't know, it has a bad rap. It is a lot of work for the, the parents. And I really understand that. Um, I understand that as a teacher of public school. I understand that as a teacher of homeschool. Um, Saxon is a lot of work for the adults. But there are so many things that Saxon does right that I just have so many success stories. I just, I got a thank you card in the mail yesterday from a student that has taken my uh, Saxon algebra, algebra two and geometry. Um, and she was in the beginning of my advanced math class, but she went to college or she was applying to colleges and um, she was able to get into all four colleges that she applied to. And she just wrote just a wonderful thank you note. And it's always, you know, I don't need the ego boost, but it sure does reinforce that I'm doing something right mm. in that I'm, you know, trying to help them create this environment for math so that I just thank God because, you know, that it's wonderful to be able to do what he's asking me to do. Oh, yeah. You're, you're giving God glory because you are really opening doors in the minds of young people to be able to just open themselves to the, the possibility that they can succeed at this and then the experience of succeeding at it. And you were talking about Saxon. Um, part of what I noticed that Saxon does very well is that kind of spiral effect of constantly reviewing past lessons. And so right. some parents will have them do the odd numbered problems one day and the evens the next day. There's a lot of different ways to work with it rather than doing every single problem. But say more sure. about what you like about the program. Well, I like, as you say, the spiral effect. So they are constantly reviewing. That's one of the things. The uh, another one is that they review the first 20 lessons of any of the books, except the geometry, are a review of the the previous course. So it they work together. Um, they have to do geometry along with their algebra skills. And it seems like to a layperson that these are very randomly put together. But they really aren't because the the ways that children think about certain things, um, you can make connections between the different lessons. Uh, things, if, lessons that don't seem to have anything in common. For example, graphing the equation of a line and learning inequalities, uh, how to solve an inequality equation. Those don't seem to have much to do with it, each other. But you can relate them, and when they are doing those two things, I can show, see, this is how the inequalities will work into this, and this is how it, may, it will have larger meaning. Um, and, you know, so there are lots of different things. Not having, uh, like, 10 concepts and then a review and then a test is so important because then they are you're reviewing constantly. You don't have that big review at the end. Um, whenever the students take my semester exams, they always say, oh, well, that really wasn't that hard. Well, no, because you're reviewing so often, you already know all of these concepts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not like I have to reach back 
three months to something that we learned at the beginning. No, you're using that every single day. So right. that is, you know, so important for them. And, you know, for that struggling learner, again, that's another way that you're building success for them. So it's not biting off so much. Jackson does things in little, you know, small increments. Uh, it's mm-hmm. called an increment. And that is really big. You'll have kids doing calculus that never thought they would make it through algebra. And I know that that's because of the unique way that Saxon is is set up. Mm, That's awesome. Yeah, and it occurs to me, too, that if the parents are doing it offline, they're not, say, doing it live with you, they could use those Mm -hmm. 20 weeks of review over the summer and just keep dipping into it, maybe at a gradual level, so that when the new semester begins, they're a little ahead in the book, and they've done their review, the kids have not forgotten everything they learned from the last semester, just a thought that that's one maybe little innovation, maybe for the kid who especially loves math and wants to be very advanced at a young age, for whatever reason. Um, Let's see. So talk a little bit about that then. What is What would be an advantage to doing it rec- uh, a live or a recorded class online versus doing it strictly at home? Okay. So if you, as a parent, feel that you just can't explain why you are, why math is, you know, why a particular topic is needed, um, I that's why I would, re- would, recommend that they take a recorded or a live class because I try to spend a lot of time explaining the whys of math. You know, we can all, you know, subtract five from both sides of an equation and, you know, solve. But if that has no meaning for you other than, okay, I want to get this these 30 problems done, um, that's not very beneficial. So, you know, live or recorded classes um, I would recommend if you can't explain the math. Now, I would I would suggest a recorded class if your child is a uh, works at a slower pace. If they want to go back and check things on their own, um, if a time schedule of four lessons a week is going to give them super high anxiety. Um, those kinds of students I would recommend for the recorded class. But I would recommend a live class to students who are college bound, especially those who are going to go into a math field or a science field, because you do need to learn those deadlines. You do need to learn how to learn in a specific time frame. Um, that's, that's almost as important as learning the curriculum in any class. So, you know, live versus recorded, again, it depends on your learner, but I would seriously think that sometimes kids need that a little bit of stress put on them to get those assignments done. And if it's someone other than mom <laughs> saying you have to do these, that sometimes is easier as well. I know it it was easy. It's much easier to teach that to one of my live or recorded courses uh, students rather than my own children. I remember fighting, struggling with my own, getting them to do things. So sometimes it's just, you know, they need a different person rather yeah. than the parent. Yeah, that's really true, isn't it? They need another voice in their lives sometimes. And that's one of the things I'm so proud of with Homeschool Connections is that the teachers really care. And uh, as long as parents are, you know, keeping an oar in the water as far as making sure that that child is showing up for classes and and check in, make sure they're getting their deadline work done and let the instructors know if they're falling behind and they need help, uh, it can work extremely well. Um, Close us out with a few words on why math anxiety is just such a problem for us. Okay. Well, math anxiety is huge because I think young people feel a lot of pressure to be the best. Um, I know that we, we want the best for our children. So sometimes we will say things that are not helpful to them, that are put more stress on them 
like, well, you should know this or come on, you're smart. You can get this when those kinds of things actually make them more anxious because they don't know and they are struggling. Um, I think we need to look at math a different way and we need to say it's okay to struggle. It's okay not to get something the first time. And when you make that, and parents, if you are a parent who is not the greatest at math, let your child see you struggle and say, you know what? I don't get this either, but we need to learn this. This is so important. This is so important for your future. Let's learn this and be enthusiastic about it. Let's learn this. Let's do this. Um, I was building a brush pile, which I don't know if you know that there is an actual important step to making a brush pile for different habitats, for different species. For example, uh, snowshoe hare. So I was making a brush pile and my, my husband and I were doing it and we broke the chainsaw and he was <laughs> so upset. And I said, okay. So let's think about, we need to problem solve. Let's think about this a different way. And he at first looked at me like, are you nuts? Of course <laughs> there's no other way. But then he, you know, he stopped and he thought, and we kind of looked around and we said, okay, there are some down trees over there. How can we bring them over here? Et cetera, et cetera. My whole point is that when something doesn't work, okay, I've tried these things, Mrs. Heft said, and guess what? We still don't get it. <laughs> don't enthusiastically say, we're in this together. We both need to learn this. Let's figure out how to do this. Go to YouTube and look at some YouTube videos. Go to a different curriculum. Call me. <laughs> Let's call <laughs> Mrs. Heft. Let's email Mrs. Heft and see if she can give us some help. But do it together because they will see how invested you are and that will take the anxiety away and it will make them more interested in finding that answer. Mm, so I love that's that. My, that's my uh, pretty much the, the whole insight. Do it together. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. Taking it seriously, scheduling it, making space in, in the actual physical space, but also in time, doing it together, having a great attitude about the challenge and the importance of it all. You really touched on some things that I think can build a really nice kind of encouraging framework for us stepping into a new year of math work with our kids. Thank you so much, Jean. I really, I feel encouraged too. I almost wish I was back in time and, and because I certainly did, before we found you, did some math years not very well and there was a lot of anxiety in our house. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm so glad that I was able to work with your daughter. She was just a wonderful, wonderful student. And I, all of the students that I work with, I feel so blessed. Oh, yeah. And they do, too. Um, Mrs. Seft is very well known and loved it. Homeschool Connections and Beyond. Remember, everybody, that you can find Jean Heft, J-E-A-N-H-O-E-F-T, at JeanHeftEducationalServices.com. And that is on the show page for you. Again, Jean, thank you so much. It was just such an enjoyable conversation. And everybody, please stay tuned for our short feature coming right up. This is Dan Lozonas from EinsteinBlueprint.com. Today, I want to talk briefly about the impact of the pandemic or the overreaction to the pandemic or, or whatever. Let's just call it the coronavirus situation. Let's talk about its impact on the vocational and career training of our homeschooled children. The end game that, that we want to prepare them and equip them to thrive in. I have four big, mostly positive economic lessons that I want to cover. The first one, the first big lesson of Corona is that it's actually a history lesson. <laughs> the last 40 years or so have historically been economically very calm, so expansive and smooth that we've all been lulled into a state of permanent prosperity. But it's not just the history books that saw this coming. Jesus clearly promised 
that in this world, we would have hardship. <laughs> the second big lesson of Corona is that we need a bigger rainy day fund. While many of us had penny-pinching, purse-clutching grandparents who, who had been financially traumatized by the Depression, subsequent generations, and that would be us and our kids, have never really experienced such profound scarcity and volatility as they did at young ages. Remember, Noah started to build the ark long before it started raining. The third big economic coronavirus lesson that applies directly to our kids and ourselves is that college just got a whole lot more expensive. I can't imagine paying the crazy tuition these days for cross-country Zoom lessons. Now, I will give the university some grace. The, the news cycle was certainly very scary in the spring, and so an abundance of caution was probably called for at the time. But going forward, I can't imagine paying full freight for a fraction of the college experience. I mean, 28% of people meet their spouses at college, presumably in the absence of masks. And now as the kids return to college campuses, not all campuses, but some, it's got to be nerve wracking for moms and dads these days. Parents who saved for years and worked hard and worked toward getting their kids into college to know that at any moment, their kids might be sent home from school based on another spike or reported spike in the coronavirus yet again, or whatever virus that, that happens in two or three years from now. As far as I'm concerned, College's value proposition was already skating on very thin ice before this happened. Again, it's getting very, very expensive. The fourth big coronavirus lesson is that pure entrepreneurship just became even more desirable. For sure, a great many small businesses that depend on foot traffic and travel and whatnot have been hammered into bankruptcy in many cases. But many more diversified self-employed people have been less scathed, and in some cases, very, very profitable. For example, small fortunes have been made selling masks and hand sanitizer. People who can fix up bicycles and online teachers and homeschool curricula sellers are also doing really well. I just got off the phone with a moving company who was insanely busy. Of course, they're based in New York City, and most of the moves are heading out of town. So there you have it, four big takeaway lessons from the coronavirus situation that are highly relevant to our homeschooled kids today. Their career outlooks going forward have to account for everything that has transpired in the past several months. Because in this new normal, the government can apparently snap its fingers, turn off all sorts of economic infrastructure. They can change buying patterns and earning patterns and even travel patterns right on a whim. So if you want to raise entrepreneurial kids who are resilient, flexible, who have diversified income streams, kids who become adults that can move and reinvent themselves and, and not wilt, but actually thrive in the face of massive change and even catastrophe. If you want to learn how to turn your, your children into kid trillionaires, then visit my 15-year-old homeschool son's website, kidsgetrich.com. And that's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com. Be sure to subscribe to Homeschooling Saints and leave us an honest review. God bless you and thank you for joining us.